Well, would you look at that? It's been exactly one year since the release of High Guardian Spice. Twas but a year ago that the world changed forever. Volcanoes erupted, seas parted, and my sanity dropped to an absolute low. You know, I thought I'd be done with this show by now, but I still got an abridged series to finish and a bunch of other stuff I gotta wrap up, so I guess we're stuck with it for now. My soul has been damned to talk about this show eternal. But if this is your first time seeing this show, High Guardian Spice was a Crunchyroll original that did not meet expectations, if there were any expectations at all. The internet exploded with reviews of this thing because everyone hated it. But you know something that's funny? As much as I talk about this show, I have not made a single review. I've mostly either just made memes about it or talked about it in video essays, but I never actually did a full-on review of the show. So for this most special occasion, I will gift to you my review of High Guardian Spice. Finally, took long enough. One year is like a billion years in internet time, so reviewing this show is kind of like digging up a prehistoric artifact. But before we get to that, some context. So this show was announced all the way back in 2018 and was originally supposed to come out in 2019, but the company held it back after the huge backlash that the show got. Or at least that's the running theory as to why Crunchyroll decided to push back its release date by like a whole two years. The reason this show got so much backlash right at the start was because Crunchyroll promised people that it was going to use their money to fund anime. If you haven't pieced it together by now, High Guardian Spice isn't an anime, so essentially they lied. So right from the get-go, we're not doing so hot because Crunchyroll promised that it would produce anime and is now giving us something that looks like a Cartoon Network project that got shit out in an afternoon. And what wasn't helping matters was the fact that the first official trailer wasn't really showing the show, like at all. It was more like a glorified ad for the studio rather than the actual show they were pretending to advertise. I also cannot forget this gem of a line. The fact that Crunchyroll Originals is doing this as a 2D animated series is giving us an opportunity to do things artistically that a lot of other shows and other studios really have forgotten how to do. Ah uh, yeah, High Guardian Spice's 2D animation's really pushing the boundaries, guys, doing things that people have forgotten. It contains ancient knowledge that, okay, I'm just kidding, the show is terribly animated, oh my god. So this comes out, everyone memes on it, Crunchyroll panics, pushes it back to 2021, and here we are. The show has one or two really bad trailers before it officially releases, and oh my god, it was awful. So there's your tiny little history lesson. If you want to know more about the controversies, there's like a hundred videos on that online you can find. The YouTuber C Puff Person did a really great series on it, so I suggest you go check that out because it goes over pretty much everything in the series. But you know, having an entire year to think about it, putting the controversy behind us, was the show really as bad as everyone made it out to be? Well, that's what we're here to figure out, so join me as I review High Guardian Spice a whole year later. I'm going to be splitting this up into three sections. First, I'll tackle the production value, then the plot, and finally the characters. So let's jump right on in. So before we get into the writing, why don't we tackle one of the easier parts first, the production value. Now I'm gonna have to say this early on to get it out of the way, the production value alone isn't what makes a show for me. I've seen stuff with horrendous production value that I still enjoy because of good writing. Now from what I've been told, this show had a budget of around 3 to 4 Chuck E. Cheese tokens, maybe 5 if we want to push it. And it, it definitely shows this thing looks cheap as hell. Now, the animation does get slightly better later on in the series, but for the early episodes, it's really bad. The animation is, well, it's, it's, um, it's, it's animated, I guess? It has that ever-so-present feeling of cheapness and jank that I ever so love. Watching this show gives me the same vibe as watching someone play a Steam asset flip, if you know what that is. And we also can't forget the errors. Oh my lord, the errors. Now listen, we all make mistakes, you know, me especially, I've made some mistakes in the past, like I spelled Ray Rodriguez's name wrong that one time, sorry Ray. But it gets to a certain point where there's so many that it starts to get distracting. I'm making a video series going over every single animation error in the show, and there's over 50 in the first episode alone. It was really funny because every time that I'd upload a meme or some clip of this show, someone would point out an animation error inside the clip that I didn't even notice until I uploaded it. 
This show was riddled with errors, either due to the fact that the storyboards were poorly made or they just didn't have enough money to get everything fixed. And a lot of the errors in this show were continuity errors, go figure. You'll have objects randomly disappearing and reappearing in between shots, characters teleporting into different classrooms, and parts of people's clothing just morphing and changing over and over and over again. And with all the errors throughout the series, there is one that stands above them all as King. The stock image lamp post with the watermark still left on it. I hope to the great slime boy above that he actually paid for that stock image and didn't just rip it off Google. That's the kind of mistake I expect to see in a YouTube fan video, not an actual produced show made by a large company. The janky animation combined with the writing and dialogue makes this show feel so awkward. It's like a show that's going through the motions of being a show rather than actually being one. Are we absolutely certain this show was made by humans and not some advanced AI using Cartoon Network shows and bad fan fictions as a baseline? I need to look into that robot conspiracy theory because a lot of the pieces add up if you think about it. Moving on from the animation, the sound design is okay, I guess. In the early episodes, it can be kind of hard to hear what people are saying over the music. All aboard is going to Lingarth. That seems to mostly be fixed later on in the series. The first episode is just really, really bad for some reason. As for the music, it ranges from being extremely generic to very, very obnoxious. The intro theme sounds like something you would hear in a Barbie commercial. All of the dreams will soon come true if we only try. All of it has a very Disney kid show vibe to it. Which is very strange because this show is supposedly meant for mature audiences and also has a lot of blood and gore in it, but we'll get to that later. What I can say for certain is I didn't like it. It was very obnoxious even the first time around, and after the second episode I just had to skip the intro because it was making my ears bleed. The outro does not fare much better either. It feels like they cranked the auto-tune up to 100. Friends for a lifetime! What the hell happened? Did Rosemary and Sage turn into androids? I guess that's more proof to my robot theory. As I said earlier, the music ranges from shit to eh. There weren't really any tracks that stood out to me for being good. The only ones that I can remember are ones that I didn't really like that much. Moving on from the music, the voice acting. Surely that's great, right? I am Slime Boy. You're... you're what now? That's what everyone calls me. I kind of like it. Uh, you know, it's the same th slime, and then boy. Why do they call you that? I got caught with ink legs in, in my dorm once. You know inkles? They're, um, slimy. Damn. Memes aside, the topic of voice acting in this show is actually very interesting. It's actually shocking the amount of well-known voice actors they got in on this dumpster fire. They got the voice actor for Rita Repulsa, Liquid Snake, and also Prozy D of all people. Prozy D was also in Onyx Equinox, too, which makes me wonder what kind of dirt Crunchyroll has on this guy. Alright, I'm kidding, but it is kind of funny how much voice talent they pulled in only for the voice acting to come out very mediocre at best. Now, of course, I'm not saying that the voice actors are bad on their own. I'm sure they do well in other series. But here, it's just kind of mid for the most part. The only real standout performances are the ones that stand out because of how memeable they are like Slime Boy. Putting that past us, let's talk about the art direction and character designs. Now, I haven't talked about this much because I'm not very knowledgeable on great art direction or what makes a good character design, etc. So I can really only talk about how I thought about them personally, and most of it's not great. One thing I will say is the background art is actually pretty decent. I've heard several people argue that the background art is actually the best thing in the show, which I guess is kind of true. It's really funny to me that one of the best things in the show, the background art, is something that's pushed to the background. So while we have these amazing backgrounds, we also have these terribly animated characters stuck right on top of them to take you out of the immersion. As for the rest of the artwork, it kind of feels very generic. One thing I'll touch on in the writing section is how this show has no idea what it wants to be. The show fails to nail a consistent style, and it just comes out as Cartoon Network adjacent sludge. Most of the designs are extremely generic and don't stand out that much, and the ones that do stand out usually stand out because they either don't fit or just look really bad. Parsley's brothers, for example, who look like horrifying gremlin creatures. 
We also can't forget a niece who looks like she belongs in a completely different show. It's not that this design is bad, it just doesn't fit in with everything else around it. Her hairstyle combined with the janky buggy animation made me think I was looking at pre-patch cyberpunk. In 2077, what makes someone a criminal? Getting caught. We also have our main character, Rosemary, who has anime protagonist hair syndrome. But even the giant puffballs can't save her from mediocrity. If your main character has huge pink pom-poms for a haircut and it still manages to look uninspired, you know you failed. The only designs that I can say I thought looked somewhat decent would be the Triad and also Snapdragon. Not that they're award winners or anything, but they're better than the rest. So to summarize, the animation is jank, the music sucks, the character designs are mid along with the voice acting, and the art direction seems to be confused. Not looking great, but hey, at least they can save themselves in the writing department. I mean, it's not like the writing is horrendous, filled with holes, and also extremely distracting, right? Ah. <sighs> Okay, let's get into the writing stuff now, why don't we? Also, before I go, Amaryllis's hair looks like a stingray. All of our dreams will soon come true If we only try All of our hopes come shining through Just look into my eyes Now, let's talk about the plot, or more precisely, the lack of one. Okay, that's being a little overdramatic. It does have a plot, it's just a completely nonsensical one that's underfocused. I've said it before and I'll say it again a million times, this show doesn't know what it wants to be. By that I mean it tries to do several different things at once and in doing so fails to do all of them. The story follows four main girls, Parsley, Sage, Rosemary, and Time, as they go about their adventures in a magical school that's also extremely violent and nearly kills them every day. Now this show desperately wants to be a slice of life show following the four girls doing wacky stuff, but it also has an overarching plot for some reason. Now, of course, I'm not saying you can't do that well, it's just not done well here. So, the main four girls want to become guardians. What is a guardian? Uh, it's, it's, uh, some, um, uh, uh, nobody fucking knows. The show gives very half-hearted explanations as to what a guardian is, but it doesn't actually fully explain it, and we never get any details on what are guardians, what are they like, who are the guardians, do they help people? We don't know. I think the teachers at the school are guardians. Maybe. I could be wrong about that. They never say. So do the guardians just grow up to teach other guardians, or do they do other stuff in between teaching? The most I can stitch together is that they just fight monsters, since that's basically all the girls do in every single mission. What I can say for certain is that this school sucks major ass, and I have an entire video explaining that. The teachers are all negligent lunatics who are barely qualified to do their own jobs. They're the kind of teachers who will push their students through deadly obstacle courses where many have died in the past, then send them into death caves completely unprepared for the treacherous things within. And after tormenting them, torturing them, and nearly getting them killed, they'll then lecture them about being too violent. Ignoring the fact that none of this makes any fucking sense if you take two seconds to think about it, the fact that we don't know why the girls are going after being a guardian makes it impossible for us to root for them. From my perspective, it just looks like they're risking their lives for absolutely nothing. This school doesn't respect them or their time, and we have no idea what a guardian is or what that even gets you, so why would we care if they become guardians or not? So one of the main goals in the series is utterly nonsensical and might as well not even be there. So the whole guardian thing's a bust, what about the other main plot point? The main plot revolves around this mystical force known as the Rot, which is draining life out of the planet. It destroys nature and completely erased an entire forest, so that's bad. On top of this, there's this evil group known as the Triumvirate, which are the big bad of the series, and they want the Rot to continue for some reason. I'm not sure why they would want the entire planet to get destroyed. At least in a lot of stories where there's some big evil corporation destroying the planet, we know why they're doing it. It's for money and power. So does the rot give them some sort of power or money or anything? Well, it doesn't seem like it. All it does is destroy stuff, and we've never seen them gain anything from it. We don't really know their motivations or why they're doing what they're doing, so again, it's really hard to get invested into this story. Maybe that was one of those things they were going to explain in the mystical season 2, which we're never gonna get. 
So we don't really understand why the villains are doing anything right now. This can work sometimes if you're trying to set up like a mystery or something that the audience has to figure out, but this show does not reward you for thinking, it does the opposite. The more effort you put into trying to understand this story, the more stupid it gets. So the big bads want the rot to continue for who knows what reason, and they decide that if anyone gets in the way of that, they're going to kill them. Now, luckily for the Triumvirate, it seems barely anybody is interested in tackling this rot problem at all. An entire forest and most of its inhabitants were wiped off the map by this rot, and nobody seems to notice. Not to mention some of the people who lived in the forest previously before it got destroyed now live close to where the Guardian School is. Did nobody think to tell the superhero people about the whole rot thing that's potentially a threat to all of human life? So either everyone who escaped this forest is a moron for not informing people about this incredibly dangerous catastrophe, or the Guardians are all negligent douchebags who care more about getting drunk off their asses than actually fixing the world's problems. Insert political commentary here. Although, being honest, if the show really went hard on the fact that the Guardians are all negligent dipshits and didn't really care about the world at large, it could be a lot more interesting. Imagine a story where the girls start out being mystified by Guardians, thinking they're the saviors of humanity, but the second the veil gets lifted they realize they're all negligent assholes who only care about themselves. And now because the quote-unquote heroes are not doing their jobs, the girls actually have to rise up and be the real heroes of the story, and oh no, I'm talking about the boys, aren't I? My mistake. Moving back to the story about the rot, I think another big issue is that only one of the main girls really has an interest in doing anything about it. This of course being Time, whose home, the Fairy Woods, was destroyed by the rot, so now she's trying to figure out a way to fix it. So Time actually has a connection to the main story and is actually trying to solve the problem. She's taking her own initiative and actually trying to fix the world around her, making her an actually interesting character as compared to the rest. Although, let's not go too far, her personality is something that I would describe as slightly aggressive tree stump, but we'll get to that in the character section. But outside of time, none of the main girls have any connection to the rot at all. In fact, none of them knew it existed until time brought it to their attention. Although I guess technically Rosemary would have some connection to the main story because her mother is secretly working for the Triumvirate. Big twist. But Rosemary doesn't know that, so the only main girl who has a reason to actually go through the plot is Time. So three out of four of the main characters don't have a reason to deal with the story. They're not truly connected with it, so it just feels like they're going on a side quest for this random chick they've only known for a few months at best. Again, it's really hard to get invested in this because there's not really much to get invested in. The story is unexplained and confusing, and the main characters don't really have much of a reason to interact with it anyway, which leads to most of the episodes just being pointless filler. The pacing is also really out of whack, with things rising to 100 and falling to zero at the drop of a hat. Specifically after episodes 8 and 9, where the main girls nearly get murdered by a cat lady, only to then go back to doing filler nonsense for the rest of the series until the end. This whole thing with the rot and witch country and the triumvirate just feels like a tacked on piece of the story that was stitched together into this mess. It's like a side mission in a video game with no main quest. Again, as I said, the show doesn't know what it wants. Does it want this to be important or does it want to just go back to doing filler shit? The writers can't make up their mind. They want to have their cake and eat it too and we end up with this as a result. And that leads me into the next section of this video, the characters. Oh boy. Okay. In a show like this, where the plot is almost non-existent, the production value is god-awful, the only thing standing between it and being a terrible show is the characters. So I bet these characters have gotta be great, right? Ha 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 ha, no. Let's start with the main four, specifically Rosebarb. Rosemary is barely a character, she's more like a bunch of anime protagonist tropes shoved together in one giant amalgus mass. She's clumsy, loud, obnoxious, unfunny, eats too much, and is just overall really annoying. You think I'm annoying? True and... Yeah, that's pretty true. That's true and yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's pretty true. That's pretty true. I mean, that's true. 
but her mother is also dead, but not really, and gave her a magic sword, and she wants to be a superhero. God, this is so bland. It's the same story you've been told a million times in the past, except done worse. If you're just going to rehash every single anime main character in existence, you could at least either add something new or tell it better than the rest. Unfortunately, they don't, so we're left with this huge nothing of a main character who might as well be a prop. And that goes for a lot of the characters. They're either incredibly bland or incredibly inconsistent. Or, bonus, incredibly annoying. I'm not going to tackle Sage too much here because I have a whole video on why she's a terrible character. To summarize, she's a huge jerk to her friends, doesn't have that many likable character traits, and was overall mishandled throughout the series. This is also not covering all the new magic, which is integral to her character arc, and the old and new magic is a whole other problem that takes, like, multiple videos to explain, so I won't be tackling it here either. Let's just say the magic system is utter garbage and leave it at that. So, two of the main four girls just kinda suck. Sage is incredibly obnoxious and Rosemary is incredibly bland, and both of them get on my nerves for how annoying they are. So that leaves us with two more, Parsley and Time. Parsley is actually pretty alright for the most part. She's a lot nicer and level-headed than most of the other characters, making her look like the least sociopathic out of the bunch. She also had a kind of interesting family dilemma where her parents didn't want her to go out to be a guardian, but she really wanted to be one because she wants to be more than just like a house slave. The issue with this is that it doesn't make sense if you think about the wider story. You see, being a guardian, from what we know, is one of the worst things you can do. It leads to death more times than not, and there isn't really much reward for being one. You don't even seem to go out and help people all that much. The only time we see them really go out and be heroes is when they're dealing with the Sister Academy of High Guardian Academy. So essentially, it's the guardians just taking care of themselves rather than other people. So honestly, right off the bat, the parents have an extremely convincing argument as to why Parsley shouldn't be in this academy. Even if Parsley wants to go off and do her own thing and not be locked in the family business, she can still do that without going to a death camp. So it's really hard to see Parsley's side of this. If the story actually gave us a reason why Parsley would want to be there as opposed to being literally anywhere else, like, I don't know, telling us what a guardian is, the storyline might make sense. You see, this is a great example of why having a bunch of problems in your show can add up over time. The school being utterly nonsensical leaks into other people's storylines since they're connected to the school. The idea of Parsley having a falling out with her family is fine on its own, but when you add in the wider context of the series, it falls apart. Now, while Parsley is mostly fine throughout the series, there is one specific moment where she breaks her own character, and that made me kind of dislike her. It was this part right here in episode 6 where she smashes a man's foot simply because he called Rosemary stuck up. Parsley has never done anything like this beforehand and never goes on to do anything like this afterwards, so why all of a sudden is she assaulting people for minor insults? It was completely out of character for her and made absolutely no sense in the moment. Not to mention everyone laughed it off like assaulting people is just a perfectly fine thing to do. Keep in mind, this is the same school that threatens suspension over student-on-student -student violence. Yes, I will continue to bring this up because it's one of the key points of inconsistency in the series. Consistency seems to be the one major area where this series screws up the most. And the characters are no exception to this. There are several moments where the characters will actively break their own character because the plot needs them to. Like that Parsley scene I just showed you. The reason I think this happened was because the writers thought it would be funny if Aster got his toe smashed and realized Parsley had a hammer, therefore they just made Parsley do it. They just didn't think about Parsley's entire character before making that gag. These people are perfectly willing to throw away everything regarding the series' storyline and world-building and characters for simple jokes. And nine times out of ten, the jokes fall flat. Was it really worth it? So I brought up Time in the earlier sections, and she's essentially the only character who has a connection to the rot, aka the main plot. If you can even call it the main plot at this point, I don't even know. We first meet her when she nearly gets decapitated by Rosemary, and Sage responds by arguing with her about the size of Rosemary's sword. Classic Sage, someone almost got decapitated and her response is to start a petty argument about the size of the weapon that nearly killed her. So right from the jump, Time does not like these two at all and is making sure everybody knows it. She only seems to really have a connection to Parsley and the other two are just obnoxious losers who she doesn't want to be around. That is, until the story arbitrarily decides that they can be friends now. It felt about as organic as a McDonald's chicken nugget. Now, if I were time, I would book it away from these loonies as quickly as possible, but that's just me. 
Now, while time is better than Rosemary and Sage, she also does have her own series of stupid decisions that make me question her as a character. Summoning a demon to open a portal to talk to her dad so he can replicate a formula for water is probably peak of the list. Why she thought this would work at all is beyond me. Not to mention it's incredible that she even has access to a demon summoning ritual. Where the hell did she get that? Does High Guardian Academy just leave powerful demon summoning rituals lying around? Well, this is the same school that dispenses magical super weapons out of glorified gumball machines, so I guess it's not too out of character. So that's the main four out of the way. Is there anyone else worth mentioning? Well, yeah, there's also Olive the Cat Lady Wizard, who is one of the main villains of the series. She's a little more interesting than the rest of the other characters, but still kind of stupid. And of course, we can't forget Amaryllis, one of the best characters in the series. Fun fact, her last name is Mick Moneybags. Do with that information what you will. Characters like Snapdragon and Amaryllis are fine for the most part. As for the rest of the cast, they either range from being incredibly mid or incredibly bad. I guess Nepicat was kind of funny sometimes. So, in this area, there's not much to write home about, go figure. This entire show rests on the shoulders of a very small group of side characters. The main four range from bland to obnoxious, so that means it's up to the side characters to pick up their slack. Amaryllis really pushes this show forward, but gonna be honest, it's not enough. So that wraps up the character segment. I guess that means it's time to move on to conclusions. So, we've gone through the production value, the plot, and the characters. Overall, what's the final verdict? Well, I'm gonna rank these areas individually and then give a final score. So, starting with the production value, 2 out of 10. This show was animated really poorly early on. It gets a little better later, but it's too little too late. The other aspects, like the sound design, the music, the voice acting, don't really save it. The only reason I'm giving this a 2 as opposed to a 1 is because the background art is pretty good and also it's not food fight level at least. Although some people are probably going to disagree with that one. Next, the plot. 1 out of 10. This is one of the worst plots I think I've seen in a long while. At least one that came out of a professionally made show produced by a large company and not some weird YouTube project. This is borderline bad fan fiction tier levels of writing. Although even saying that out loud sounds like a malicious insult against fan fiction, so I apologize. The story makes absolutely no sense if you take more than two seconds to think about it, and there isn't really a reason to get invested. Things in the plot just kind of happen whenever the writer wills them to, and it doesn't make sense or flow right. Usually when you're going through a story, you don't want it to feel like the writer's behind the scenes with a stick pushing the characters in the right direction, but that's literally what it feels like here. Not to mention the story feels like an extended distraction rather than an actual story. Really lame, guys. Now finally, the characters. 3 out of 10. As much as I don't want to say it, the characters are the strongest point in this entire series, mostly due to standouts like Amaryllis and Snapdragon. In a show with an almost non-existent plot and no production value, you need good characters to really sell it. But again, they kind of screwed up. A lot of the main characters suck and the side characters can't do enough to save it. So there's our final scores, a 2, a 1, and a 3. What is the final verdict for High Guardian Spice? The official Dave review, one could say. 2 out of 10. The show is bad, big shocker there. There really is almost nothing here for you to get attached to. Almost every single element of the show is fundamentally flawed in some way, it's almost baffling. The production was a hot mess and it bleeds onto the screen something fierce. Even when you do manage to find somewhat good aspects of the show, they end up getting ruined by the horrendous amount of terribleness around them. You aren't here for good production value, you aren't here for a good plot, and you aren't here for good characters, so why are you here? Well, there is a reason, and I think High Guardian Spice is actually worth watching. Because of two very important factors. One, it has so much wrong with it that it serves as the perfect teaching tool for what not to do in a series. From now on, when someone's struggling with making a show, they can always just look at High Guardian Spice and go, Oh yeah, don't do that. You can learn a lot more from terrible media than you ever could from really good shows. Now instead of you having to fail, you can just look at this huge dumpster fire which failed already and learn from its mistakes. And there's also the second reason why you should watch this show. Get a bunch of friends together and then just make fun of it. Making fun of this show with a good set of friends is incredibly entertaining. 
So my suggestion to you is if you're actually gonna bother watching it, watch it with friends. It makes it so much better. Or you could watch my Abridge series, just saying. Well, there you have it. High Guardian Spice a whole year later. Even pushing all the controversy behind us, I still think this show is really, really bad. Consider yourself lucky you don't have to put up with it as much as me. Oh, the agony. Well, that's basically all I had to say for this one, so I'll see you guys later. This has been Dave, and I am leaving. The fact that Crunchyroll Originals is doing this as a 2D animated series, it's giving us an opportunity to do things artistically that a lot of other shows and other studios really have forgotten how to do. Oh my god! I don't know if I can let that slide.